Okay, folks, it's uh, just gone 12 noon, and uh, we're about to begin. So a very warm welcome to you all uh, to our service. We have some visitors, and we welcome each and every one of you to our fellowship in the Lord's name. We welcome those of you who are joining us online uh, as well. Now, let me just uh, quickly uh, go through a number of uh, notices. Um, first of all, we're, we're saddened at the, the passing of Margaret McLean um, from the Rizolas end of our congregation. Uh, Margaret uh, was 93. She was uh, a member of long standing for many years in our, in our fellowship, and she passed away peacefully in Mull Hall care home uh, last evening. So we remember the McLean family uh, and uh, funeral arrangements to be confirmed. Bite and Blether meets tomorrow morning, so spread the word, come along and have uh, enjoy the best of coffee and baking and a good blether. The WFM ladies it meets tomorrow evening at half past seven. Next Sunday is our Ferentosh Spring Communion. We are very much looking forward to having Alistair I. McLeod with us, uh, and um, he will conduct <coughs> all of our services next Sunday. We'll have an evening communion. We're having uh, um, a number of congregations joining us uh, for our uh, joint communion next Sunday as well. Note, if you will, our uh, <clears throat> the notice uh, with respect to church membership and anyone wishing uh, to come into membership with us, please do uh, speak to me, speak to us, speak to any of uh, our elders. would be delighted to chat with you. Uh, just a couple of things that are now being flagged for March. Just to uh, take a note uh, in, your, in your mental diary today, our AGM, Wednesday the 15th of March. The curry evening is getting ever closer. Sign up if you haven't already done so. Friday the 17th of uh, March. And on Sunday the 19th of March, uh, we'll be having a joint communion with, uh, in Maryborough. Uh, free church with again several other congregations joining us for that. Well, let's uh, focus on our call to worship uh, this afternoon, which uh, is taken from Psalm 95, the book of Psalms. Psalm 95 Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord, let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Well, these words pave the way for our opening uh, praise, which is praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation and so on so let's uh, stand and let's uh, sing this opening praise praise to the lord the almighty
Let's unite our hearts in prayer together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, sovereign God, you are worthy of all praise and adoration. So grant us to engage in our service of worship, giving glory, giving honor, and all praise to your great name. We want to praise you anew this day for the Son of your steadfast love, in whose name we gather. <clears throat> we praise you for the Lord Jesus, and we thank you for the opportunity to gather around your word anew in his name. We praise you, we bless you for your faithfulness, goodness, and grace. As you were our refuge and strength and an ever-present help to ancient Israel, so you are our refuge and our strength in our day. In our darker moments, you bring light. In our times of discouragement, you bring encouragement. You remain the same and your years will never end. So grant us, we pray, as your people to persevere in the name of Jesus, forgetting what is behind and, and straining towards what is ahead. May, may we, just like the Apostle Paul, resolve to press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenwards in Christ Jesus. And so we pray that you would bless the proclamation of the gospel across our land and beyond our shores this day. May our service of worship here be firmly focused on Jesus, He who is our hope in life and death. And on this day, as we are saddened to hear of Margaret MacLean's passing, nonetheless, we rejoice that she is now in your nearer presence. We thank you that as her pilgrimage of many years came to a close yesterday, so it came to a peaceful conclusion, and so she fell asleep in Jesus. We do commit to you the McLean family and ask that you would grant them comfort and your near presence over these days. So be with us, Lord. We wait upon you. We seek your presence with us. Shepherd us, we pray, into your word as we continue to sing your praises. Enable us, we ask, uh, to. Uh, to be kept, safeguarded, shielded from anything that might distract us from worshiping you in spirit, in sincerity, and in truth. So pardon our sins, we pray, and cleanse us, we ask, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, boys and girls, we're going to read um, the following from Mark's Gospel, we've been uh, going through personal encounters with Jesus over past weeks, and uh, we're going to go back to where it all began, by the Sea of Galilee. So we're going to read just uh, a few verses from Mark chapter 1, and then we are going back to Blondin, where we were last week, our tightrope walker. So, let's read these words together. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. 
When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now, we're calling today's talk Her Life in His Hands. So, who is she and who is he? Well, we're about to find out. Jean-Francois Gravelet, better known as Blondine, was a famous tightrope walker and acrobat. He's perhaps best known for his many crossings of the tightrope, 1,100 feet in length, suspended 160 feet above Niagara Falls in the USA. His act will be watched by large crowds and begin with a relatively simple crossing using a balancing pole. Then he would throw away the pole and amaze the onlookers. On one occasion, he crossed the tightrope on stilts. On another occasion, blindfolded. Another time, he stopped halfway to cook and eat an omelette. In 1860, a royal party from England came to watch Blondin perform. After his normal spectacular crossings, he then wheeled a wheelbarrow from one side to the other as the crowd cheered. Next, he put a sack of potatoes into the wheelbarrow and wheeled that across. The crowd cheered louder. Then he approached the royal party and asked the Duke of Newcastle, Do you believe that I could take a man across the tightrope in this wheelbarrow? Yes, I do, said the Duke. Ah, hop in, replied Blondin. The crowd fell silent, but the Duke of Newcastle would not accept Blondin's challenge. Is there anyone else here who believes I could do it? Asked Blondin. No one was willing to volunteer. Eventually, an old woman stepped out of the crowd and climbed into the wheelbarrow. Blondin wheeled her all the way across and all the way back. The old woman was Blondin's mother, the only person willing to put her life in his hands. Well, Blondin's mother was the only person who was prepared to put her life in his hands. In whose hands? In Blondin's hands, her son. The Duke of Newcastle politely declined, as did everybody else. No way am I going into that wheelbarrow with Blondin. No one was willing to volunteer except her. I'm not even sure that Duncan Fraser would have put a sack of potatoes in that wheelbarrow going across the Niagara Falls. But it was no problem for Blondin's mother. Nobody knew Blondin better than his own mother. She trusted him with her very life, so she did. In fact, she believed with all of her heart that her own son could take her across the Niagara Falls and back again. She knew that she was safe in his hands. But what would you and I have done? I do wonder. Well, when Jesus called Simon and Andrew and James and John to be his disciples, Mark tells us in our reading that they left everything for Jesus. They put their lives into his hands. They trusted Jesus as their guide, as their shepherd, as their Savior, and they followed him. Now, okay, Jesus wouldn't take them across a tightrope, no, but the journey he was taking them on would be challenging. 
and difficult at times. But they trusted Jesus, didn't they? God's one and only Son. They put their lives into His hands, just as Blondin's mother trusted her own Son. So are we trusting in Jesus today as we bring our personal encounters with Him to a close? Will you put your life in His hands? If you do, then, you know, you have nothing whatsoever to fear. He will never let you go. We are all safe and secure in the hands of Jesus. Will you take His hand as He calls us to follow Him today? Amen. Well, we're going to pray together as we do every Sunday. The words that Jesus taught His disciples. And we pray these words in unison. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to continue singing to God's praise <clears throat> before we turn to read uh, another uh, passage from Mark's Gospel we're going to sing, Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Bring the presence of the risen Lord to renew my heart and make me whole, and so on. So let's stand as we sing to God's praise.
Okay, we're going to uh, read again from Mark's uh, Gospel, and our uh, second reading from this uh, Gospel is taken from chapter 15 and at verse 22, Mark 15, 22. It's under the heading, The Crucifixion of Jesus They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with them, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Ma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely, This man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Amen. And uh, we know that God will add His blessing to the reading of His own holy Word. Well, before we continue to sing to the praise of God, shall we once again pray together. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads before You, as we call upon Your name, so we give thanks that uh, you are our great God. We praise you that your people call upon your name across our world. You hear us, you answer us. We ask, Lord, that you would be very near to the persecuted church of Jesus this Lord's Day as we remember countries, communities where there is unrest, where your people are oppressed, where they are denied the freedom to worship as we do, give us to be mindful of them as we commit, as we commend to you those who may be discouraged. We ask, Lord, that you would draw near those who are distressed, may you uplift all such. May you grant those who are afraid and anxious a tangible sense of your peace. We want to pray in particular today for believers and church leaders in Ukraine. 
We know that many church buildings have been turned into places of refuge, and we pray for all who minister with extraordinary compassion to those around them amidst the life-threatening situations they find themselves in. We pray for gospel workers who are serving in Ukraine, Crimea, Russia. We pray for Bible school teachers, for believers in many churches, and for children who have come to faith at camps in recent years. We ask, O oh Lord, that this conflict would not in any way dampen that spirit of evangelism. May the gospel advance despite this war. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would remember the communities that continue to be bombarded. We pray that evil would be restrained, that perpetrators and oppressors would be brought to justice. We ask, O Lord, that truth and justice and peace would prevail and would be established. And so hear us as we bring these matters of concern before you. We thank you that your people pray with that expectation of answered prayer. You exhort us to ask, to seek, to knock, to do so with perseverance, with persistence, with patience. And so we ask, O Lord, that you would hear us and have mercy upon us in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We're going to sing to the praise of God, uh, Psalm 19, verses 7 to 14. It's the Sing Psalms version, the perfect law of God revives the soul of man, and so on. So let's stand as we sing these words to God's praise.
Well, turn with me, if uh, you will, to Mark chapter 15, and our text is verse 39. We're going to focus on the Roman centurion who stood there in front of Jesus, who saw how he died, and said, surely this man was the Son of God. So we're doing a 50-50 split today. We're going to focus this morning on the centurion's location and tonight his testimony. So think of it as what he saw and what he said. His location, well, where the Roman centurion is standing matters. His location matters to Mark, the gospel writer. This site, this spot, this setting is a vantage point like no other. It is Calvary, no less, where Jesus is crucified. And this man, this centurion, witnesses it all. And this is where our series on personal encounters with Jesus concludes at the cross. And it doesn't get more personal than this. We've explored several personal encounters, haven't we, over past weeks, from Levi to Legion, from the man with the shriveled hand to the inquisitive scribe whom we met last week. And each counter, encounter has its own very personal dynamic. Well, think of this final personal encounter as the climax. So we're going to look at two things in relation to the centurion as far as his location is concerned. Two Ps, providence and position. So let's first of all as we lock ourselves into verse 39, uh, focus on his providence. Now, Mark tells us that this Roman centurion saw how Jesus died. So the question we want to ask today is, what exactly did he see? Well, evidently, Mark tells us that he saw much, much more than a crucifixion. So what are we to make of what the centurion saw? What are we to make of his personal encounter with Jesus? Why is it important to Mark? And how is it relevant to us today? So, the centurion of verse 39 stood there, Mark tells us, anchored to the spot. He stood there in front of Jesus as Jesus breathed his last. Perhaps not by choice, but more out of duty. This centurion with significant military clout. But what we can say is that he's not there by coincidence. He's a Roman officer, Mark tells us, with the rank of centurion. So he would have been responsible for a hundred men. And his detachment happens to be the one chosen to put Jesus to death. So that much is significant, isn't it? This centurion is the commander in charge of this high-profile execution. Now, all of this would suggest to us that he himself, this Roman centurion, was a respected military man in his own right. Perhaps it also alludes to something else. Maybe he was somewhat cold-blooded, ruthless, and even merciless in his approach to crucifixions at Golgotha. The caliber of man the Roman authorities uh, would have been looking for to, to oversee this highly charged event at Calvary, where perhaps crowd control would be an issue. He's your man, this Roman centurion. After all, 
It would be just another day at the office, so to speak, for this man. He would have observed the death of many, many crucified criminals. So picture it, he would have planned his day, clinically going over the crucifixion program for the day. He probably cared little for those who were being crucified. He was probably kind of desensitized. He's doing his job. But this crucifixion event is not like the rest, is it? In reality, he witnesses much, much more than he expected to see. He sees and hears things that are life-changing for him. And his day, it's fair to say, ends very differently to how it all began when he got up that morning. So there's a very striking providence perspective to this incident. God is at work in this man's life. So what are we to make of this? Well, I think our days, sometimes, at least, are just like his. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, you begin your day and I begin my day. You know, we propose, we plan, we, we, we plot out the day, we, we map out our activities for the day, we have a to-do list, we have a diary, and we intend to stick to the script. But divine providence says otherwise, doesn't it? Events overtake us. Something happens we weren't expecting to happen. There's a development, and God intervenes in a particular way. He shows His sovereign hand in a very personal, in a very powerful way. As events unfold, we're somewhat startled, we're shaken, our life grinds to a halt, and so our day ends, not as it began, not as we predicted. But God in His sovereignty reminds us that His ways are higher than our ways. And so as, as each of us today stand where this Roman centurion stood, I wonder how we might react as we face the same Jesus as He faced. Might it be that this Lord's Day, that today, will end differently for you? Well, so much for His providence by way of introduction. Let's focus on His position. Now, He saw much, didn't He? He really did. His position, His standpoint is quite the vantage point. And Mark specifically tells us of his exact location, doesn't he? Mark tells us that he stood there at the cross in front of the crucified Jesus, facing Jesus no more than a few feet away from him. Look at verse 24, as men, as military men, amongst others perhaps, are, are casting lots over, over Jesus' garment and mocking him, by contrast, the centurion is seen standing there facing Jesus. His focal point is the cross upon where Jesus uh, is is crucified. How long he stood there, we just don't know. But he is clearly affected by what he sees. Would he not ponder and wonder and reflect on the extraordinary events leading up to Jesus' final words on the cross? His seventh and final saying, as Luke records that for us. We were there a fortnight ago with Ian Hamilton. That decisive moment when Jesus utters these words, Father, into your hands I commit 
my spirit. And as Mark highlights here, it's then that Jesus breathed his last. Now, how much this centurion understood of what he saw and what he heard in the final moments of Jesus' atoning death on Calvary's cross is another matter. But he is there. He's there. His location matters. His position, his standpoint is significant. So let's just try and pull a few strands together in relation to what he witnesses, what he sees. So, verse 33, we're told that darkness envelops Calvary over a three-hour period. 12 noon to 3 p.m., Jesus bows his head and gives up his spirit. And when he does so, there's breaking news of a development in the temple. A remarkable development. News filters through that the curtain of the temple has been torn in two. What is happening? Well, verse 38 is a significant reference point for Mark, not least because of the symbolic significance of the dividing of this curtain. Miraculously torn, it seems, split, sliced from top to bottom, removing once and for all the separating divide between the holy place and and the exclusion zone of the most holy place, allowing full direct access to God via the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. The veil is torn. The way to God is wide open, Mark tells us, rendering the temple sacrifices now obsolete. The words of Jesus in John 14 Echo in this moment, don't they? I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. And all of this is literally and metaphorically earth shattering. So much so that Matthew tells us in his account in Matthew seven in Matthew twenty seven fifty one, he speaks of how the earth split and the rocks split. cataclysmic event in history is unfolding, and this centurion witnesses it all beyond any readings on the Richter scale. And the epicenter is Calvary. And it all revolves around Jesus And this Roman centurion that Mark draws our attention to is standing there facing Jesus as it unfolds. And there's also this, Mark tells us that many scatter, many disperse, recognizing that there is more to this than meets the naked eye. But the Roman centurion, Mark tells us, just stood there, stationary, still, fixed to the spot. Facing Jesus. His position hasn't altered. He is seen gazing at the Savior intently. Now, Matthew tells us something else. Because I suppose the question we, 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 would, we would naturally ask is, how do you think he felt? Do the gospel writers tell us anything about how he might have felt in this moment? What does this look like from an emotional perspective? Well, Matthew lifts the lid on that a little because we're told in Matthew 27, 54 that the centurion, along with a small number of others, the rest have scattered, were terrified. But if he was terrified... Why didn't he back off and and step away and distance himself like the rest? Well, the word terrified in this context 
means to be filled with awe. Filled with awe at what is taking place before his very eyes and beneath his feet. You know, in a very personal way, this centurion's situation can, can mirror your situation and my situation today. You know, in a very real sense, we too are facing the same Jesus as he stood facing. That's the wonder of the, the four Gospels we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Through, through each lens, they take us there. They paint such a graphic picture in words. They encourage us to stand where He stood so that we too can witness what He witnessed. But that challenges us, doesn't it? We stand at the cross and we too face this Jesus. Will we distance ourselves from the cross as many did on that day? Except for this centurion. Will we be distracted by other events and back off and walk away to our homes as many did? Except for this centurion. All but this Roman centurion who just stood there facing Jesus, Mark tells us. He stands out, doesn't he? He stands out for his stand. He stood while others scampered and scurried away like ants. But he's still there. I wonder if this centurion's position and reaction resonates with us. Are we filled with awe as we contemplate what he saw? Are we facing Jesus today or fleeing from him? What is your position? What is your GPS in relation to the gospel? Where do you stand? That is the question that Mark wishes us to think through. You know, the gospel calls us today to adopt the centurion's position and look to Jesus, to take our stand for Jesus and to gaze at him and submit to him. So what will the Roman centurion do? Will he submit to this Jesus? Well, We'll explore the outcome tonight at six o'clock. But the greater question is whether we will, for the first time, or anew today. So what is our only hope in life and death? It is Jesus. And you know, the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 12 exhorts us, as he puts it himself, the writer to the Hebrews. We're given every encouragement to fix our eyes upon this Jesus, who is described as the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured this cross that Mark is drawing our attention to, scorning its shame, and then went on to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, the Bible says, who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So, we are being challenged as we bring our personal encounter series to a close, will you do this today? Will you adopt the centurion's position? Will you take your stand 
Will you do that today? Will you do that next Sunday? As we look forward to a time of communion, as we look forward to the Lord's Supper, and we hear the voice of Jesus calling us, do this in remembrance of me. Will you remember the death of Jesus? Will you put your life into His hands. Amen. Let's bring our service to a close as we sing, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing these words together against the back cloth of where we've been today in Mark 15, verse 39, to God's praise.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with us all. Amen.